welcome medical students. I'm so excited to I'm so excited to be here with you today. Please sign in on the laptop and enjoy some breakfast. I know these sessions are mandatory. I also know that as students in an extremely selective medical school, you are the brightest of the bright. Since lives will be depending on you, your education would not be complete without the basics of quality research to guide your practice. So I want to deliver a training that recognizes that this isn't your area of expertise while simultaneously acknowledging your intelligence. Therefore, your feedback on the session's content and pace are constantly welcome. Let's begin with introductions and an icebreaker. We'll each say our names, pronouns, where we went for undergrad, and three things others may not know about us. Two things that are true and one that's false. The others will guess which one is false. I'll start. I'm Linda Veronica Pacora. Call me LV. My pronouns are she, her. I have a BA in psych from NAS. My master's is in library and information science from UB. I'm obsessed with cats. I have seven of them. I've been to nine countries outside the US and I'm fluent in sign language. You're right, I only have one cat and I'm allergic. I've been to Canada, England, Ireland, Germany, France, Switzerland, Italy, Turkey, and Romania. I learned sign language from my old job at DePaul, from the Health Association, and from NTID. Your turn. In the next section, we will go over the agenda and your learning goals. Take a break, walk around, use the restroom, grab a snack or a drink whenever you need to. Here's our agenda. First, we will look at the Journal of American Medical Association's definition of EBM. Then we will review your learning objectives. Next, we'll activate your prior knowledge about research, then watch four short videos. We'll have a movement break after the first two. At 9.45, you will evaluate a specific piece of research. Then we'll have a break, resume the research assignment, and then have lunch. At lunch, please talk to your colleagues about your specific medical interests for a project that we will work on tomorrow. The early afternoon is the same. We'll have a break about 1.30. Last, we will discuss the assignment as a large group. Then I'll ask you to fill out an exit ticket so I can learn what you learned, and then we'll dismiss. Medical evidence and inquiry is synonymous with evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based practice is an umbrella term that includes evidence-based medicine and other health fields such as dentistry and nursing. You can read JAMA's description of evidence-based medicine yourself. Here is the second part for you to read. Please read the third and final part. We will focus on best available evidence and whether evidence is more or less trustworthy. This part of JAMA's definition directly informs your learner objectives. These are your learner objectives. First, you'll evaluate a piece of research. We'll detail how later. Next, you'll show learning by selecting a study and determining what type of research it is. Of course, we'll discuss this further later. Next, you'll appraise your chosen research using the CASP tool. Fourth, you will analyze your partner's paper. You'll compare your findings. To fight boredom, let's switch formats.
All right, let's check in on our agenda. Um, we looked at JAMA's definition of evidence-based medicine. We went over your learner objectives. Um, next, we're going to activate your prior knowledge about research. Then we're going to watch three short entertaining videos. I watched a lot of <laughs> videos to try to find ones for you that weren't too dull. Um, these really aren't. Um, and this one is a, a little dry, but it is a bit amusing to watch the woman because you can tell she is just so done with some of the mistakes she sees. And it's from a publisher's perspective. It's actually, it's very interesting. And in between there, we'll have a little movement break. So activating prior knowledge. When you think back to undergrad or even before, how did you select research articles? Mm-hmm. Mm hmm Yes, exactly. Some of you may remember this mnemonic. Um, I'm not sure when this became a thing, but it's memorable. Um, okay, thoughts about this. Current, self-explanatory, relevant, thoughts. Yes, you don't want to waste your time if it's not what you're looking for. Authority. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Things like, is it in a peer reviewed? Is it peer reviewed? Is it in a scholarly, um, reputable um, journal? Accuracy. How would you do? Right. Yes. Exactly. So, you know, check two or three other sources to see if you get similar findings. And purpose. Anybody? Mm hmm Good. So it's twofold. What is the writer's purpose? Um, sometimes it can be quite self-serving if you haven't noticed yet. And um, right. So is it is the purpose going to fit your needs? So I know it's very basic, but um, it's still very useful when you're skimming abstracts. Right, please enjoy this video about reliability, validity, and generalizability. Any thoughts or questions on this video? Please enjoy this video on bias. All right, thoughts, questions? Okay, let's take a quick movement break. Um, it may sound silly, but it definitely helps me. Um, we've been sitting a while now. Um, please stand up, stretch your arms up as far as you can. Bend down, touch your toes. And back up, bend to one side, bend to the other side. Do some neck rolls one way, neck rolls the other way and just jog in place for a few seconds if you can. All right, great. All right, please enjoy your final video. I lied, my apologies. Um, I decided to add in one more really short video. This is a really good brief overcap of what is the difference between quantitative and qualitative research, which will be really useful for you for your assignment. Please enjoy. Hey, any questions or comments about that video? Okay, so you can choose your own groups of three or four. And as I said, um, you may choose either this article about information literacy instruction in business school, or this article about misinformation and trust in libraries. Um, <clears throat> and your group will work on the same article together. If you choose the article on um, IL skills at the business school, please feel free to skip the end of page 676 and 
the beginning of 677 um, up until you get to um, the discussion section. Um, it gets very, very tacky, and uh, this is not advanced uh, research method, so you really don't have to worry about that, and you will still get a very good understanding of what the research was about. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to um, look together as a group um, and answer all of these questions, um, yes or no, and then describe why you chose the answer that you did. Um, I'm not going to read it to you. You know how to read, so um, we'll just go through that. And as I said, we're going to have a break in about an hour. Um, you will have the whole rest of the afternoon almost to work on this. Um, if you get done early, great. We'll move up the last two things on the agenda and get you out of here early. If it takes the whole time, that's that's perfectly fine too. Um, so go ahead and get started and let me know if you have any questions. All right, um, I'm going to go over the agenda for the rest of the afternoon and then it will be time for lunch. Um, during lunch, I'll ask you if you haven't yet to choose a partner and topics that you will be looking up for your research for tomorrow. That'll be medical topics that you're interested in. Um, then we're going to resume the article assignment after lunch. Um, we'll have another little break, about two, and then you will finish the assignment or at whatever point you're finished with the assignment, we will share in the large group. After that, I'll ask you to fill out an exit ticket, which I'll show you in a moment, and we'll be done by four. All right, this is the exit ticket I will ask you to fill out at the end of the day today. Um, it's just three simple questions. Um, I just want to get an idea of um, if I was clear of, as clear as mud about something or if um, what was review that sort of thing, so um, to help me to plan for next year and also to catch catch you before the sessions are over. So I will read these tonight, and in the morning we will go over um, anything that needs clarification, and I just want to let you know what you'll be looking at at the end of the day. Okay, now that we're back together in our large group, um, let's take a look first at the Sullivan research. Okay, who had Sullivan? Okay, let's look at the title first. Leveraging Library Trust to Combat Misinformation on Social Media. Does the title fit the study? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, did Sullivan leverage library trust to combat misinformation on social media? No, his study did not find that at all. Did it find a way or suggest a method for doing so? No, not that either. So um, the title uh, promises a bit more, in my opinion, than it delivers. Um, and we'll come back to that. Okay, the abstract. It's supposed to be like a mini, mini, tiny article. See, research. Um, the method used, just a brief, brief statement about the method, um, what the results were, and what the conclusions were. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I found this abstract really confusing at first. I, I had to read this many times, and especially if you're new at research, this could be very confusing. Um, it starts out, one reason's well, excuse me, one reason librarians are confident that they have a role to play in misinformation, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a confusing way to start an abstract. And um, he doesn't even actually come out and say that the two experiments he is referring to are his experiments. It almost reads more like, to me, a, a very small liter a literature review. Um, he says, an experiment was conducted in fall 2018. At first, I'm thinking, why are we talking about two, 2018? Um, and then an unsuccessful follow-up. Those are both his experiments, we find out later. But you have to. it, it should be clear right from the start, and, and things should be presented in professional writing in a logical 
in a logical format. Okay, um, he does state the reason or the purpose for the study. The study tests whether libraries can leverage trust to combat misinformation online. Um, he doesn't mention any methods. Um, he does talk about results in the abstract. Results suggest that the misperception can be reduced, but not by library institutions, which conflicts with the title. He goes on to say that the follow-up suggests, the, uns the unsuccessful follow-up, suggests that the effectiveness of the correction is season-dependent. Would you agree with that? This reminds me of what the um, lady who publishes in Utah said about um, putting down what you wish was true. Um, I am not sure that's very accurate. I think a lot of people would argue that mid-December, when the follow-up was done, is still flu season um, and opens the possibility that libraries may yet play a role, but not necessarily because they are trusted. That's a little confusing because throughout the article, he points to a lot of previous research about how libraries are, are trusted. He doesn't really explain what he means by that. Okay, thoughts about the problem statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's not terrible. He does state the problem. It could be much clearer. Um, <clears throat> my main problem with the problem statement is that he redefines the parameters of his research here like three different times and it's also different from the abstract. So in the abstract, he's saying that he is testing whether libraries can leverage trust to combat misinformation online. Here he says um, in the problem statement, the study is an attempt to initiate within LIS, a new information research program, and to introduce a new research tool. I've read this article, I don't know how many times that I've yet to find a program in it anywhere. Um, the research tool, I believe he's referring to MTurk, which is how he got his respondents. Um, I, it's not really that clear. Um, and here he says his his study is to is a first attempt to address empirically whether libraries or library organizations can leverage trust. Oh, that's similar, yes. And um, the results of this study will help librarians and allied professionals inform them about the challenges of correcting misinformation and provide a starting point for thinking critically about the role of libraries in fighting it, which certainly is a step back from the purpose of the research that he puts at the beginning of that paragraph. Okay, thoughts about the literature review? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I actually have no issues whatsoever with the literature review. I think it's very well done. It's got four subsections here. I counted 24 different references. It's well organized. Um, it is a lot easier to follow than most of the article. Okay, we're asked um, if the importance or the need for knowledge on the topic is explained. I think Sullivan does well here. Um, there's a lot of points that he makes in statistics about um, health misinformation and the flu vaccine in particular and the ramifications of misinformation or about people not getting the flu vaccine. So I think he he did well well there. Are terms and concepts clearly defined? Yes. Mm-hmm. I agree, some are, some aren't. Um, he defines misinformation and misperception. He does not define disinformation. He does not define um, Qualtrics. He doesn't define some of the, the details, but um, some are, some aren't. Yeah. Okay, does he well explain who was studied? Um, he, yes. Mm-hmm. Right. So he refers a lot to the um, Amazon Mechanical Turk, which evidently is a pool of um, participants for potential studies. <coughs> he does say, excuse me, that um, 
they differ in important ways from the general population, including demographics, health behaviors, as well as certain psychological dimensions. But he does not expand on that. So I, uh, we have a... We have a general idea, but I don't think that there's a lot of specific detail on who he is studying. Okay, also on who was studied, he talks about um, a human intelligence task or HIT that um, the M. Turkers needed to perform. He talks about they had to have a, an approval rating of at least 95% um, and something about quail tricks. Um, again, that's not defined, and we're not told how people get this approval rating or what is entailed with the HIT. As far as what was studied, he details some of the experiment right here. Um, he doesn't, you'll typically find in the appendix all of the questions, the exact questions in the format that they were asked. He does not include that, but he does include some description here. Does the study acknowledge its limitations or problems? Yes. Mm -hmm. He talks here about um, the flu vaccine being seasonally dependent. We talked about that already. Um, he talks here about how m curve workers differ which affects the generalizability of the results. In this case, it's a moot point. Um, okay, ethical issues. Um, as you learned from the woman, the publisher in Utah, um, whenever human participants are involved in any way, a study needs to be approved by the IRB or the Institutional Review Board in your case, it would be you are. With a survey, there aren't going to be a lot of ethical uh, dilemmas, typically. One could argue that um, with the close-up of the person getting an injection, some people are bothered by that. But, uh, you know, I would say that's fairly minor. Is the quantitative data correct? We can't establish that. We've got graphs and tables here, but um, we're not given any raw data, so it would be impossible to say for sure. Okay, I skipped around a bit, but I want to get now to the main point of the study. Do you find the study valid? And valid, of course, is synonymous with true, so an easy way to remember. Does it even make sense? Does it, is it logical? Okay, thoughts about validity. Okay, let's look at the methods. How did he conduct his experiment? Mm -hmm. Yes. He asked his respondents some pre-experiment questions about demographics, social media use, source of health information, and general health. We don't see the exact questions, um, including vaccine behavior. Next, he asks all respondents um, a series of questions, including these three questions, and they are to agree or disagree on a seven-point scale. You do not need to get the flu vaccination every year. You can get the flu from the flu vaccine, or healthy people and healthy people do not need to receive the flu vaccine. He distributes these three questions across three pages. Um, with a total of nine statements, so three statements per page, to try to disguise the fact that he is looking specifically at the flu vaccine. In my opinion, you, know, you might need more than nine questions, three questions out of nine to hide that, but, um, you know, that's a moot point. So the participants are divided into five groups, a control group and four experimental groups. So this makes it what type of study? Right, quantitative. Um, they are all shown a series of three simulated Facebook pages for at least 10 seconds each. If they're in one of the experimental groups, they are also shown a Facebook page with the common misconception that the flu vaccine can cause the flu. And then they are seeing a correction to this statement by either the CDC, another user, 
a public library, we don't know which one, these are people from all over the country, or the ALA, or American Library Association. Afterward, everyone is asked again to assess three health statements, one of which is you can get the flu from the seasonal flu vaccine. They're also asked about their intention to receive the flu vaccine if they haven't already, um, what they consider the trusty wor trustworthiness of each of the sources of correction are, um, and if they're in the library group, um, how often they go to the library and use their resources. At the end, they're um, told they were exposed to a misconception and given correct health information, so I don't have issues ethically. Here we see um, an example page. This is his CDC example. Does anything, well, excuse me, do any of you notice anything unusual about this? I didn't notice it the first time I saw it, um, and I'm not sure if they only saw this page for 10 seconds like the other pages, but um, here we have CDC. He calls it a correction by the CDC. And, but what is the page they're sent to? Web page, right? healthharvard.edu. Um, so those are two different things. Okay, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on his results, but what were his results? Mm -hmm. uh, as far as change in misperception, he did find a significant change with the CDC and among females from users. There was no significant change for ALA or a public library. For intention to vaccinate, the experiment was not able to significantly increase the intention to vaccinate. And what about his replication study? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, he writes that Providing a correction to the misperception that the flu vaccine can give you the flu does not appear to significantly impact the perceived trustworthiness of the source of the correction. In fact, he even found increases in misperception um, and says there may need to, there may be testing effects. He finds that trust in libraries neither significantly affects nor is significantly affected by the correction. He also found that the only significant finding was that the ALA actually decreased um, vaccination intention. Well, that was his findings. Um, and it was the only condition for which more participants did not, to, did not intend to be vaccinated. Why do you think these were his findings? Do you find his testing methods valid? Mm-hmm. Right. Was he testing whether or not trust in libraries can combat misinformation? Is that what he was actually testing, in your opinion? Why? We see a lot of previous research in his literature, literature review that indicates that people do trust libraries. Mm-hmm. Yes, if a large organization like the ALA or the CDC or even a public library uh, wanted to combat misinformation, is this how you think they would go about it? Right. I can't imagine that an organization would use its limited resources employing somebody to sit at their computer scanning um, Facebook pages to see if anybody happens to have a misconception about health on there. In fact, I might argue that it could have the opposite effect. One wouldn't expect to see something like that pop up on their Facebook page. And ironically, he specifically mentioned that the reason he chose Facebook for his platform for his experiment was that was the one that M Turkers were using the most often, which I have a couple of issues with that. I don't, it sounds like he is um, adapting his experiment to M Turkers, um, but also trying to 
generalize the study the study results to the US population and he's already indicated but without specifics that mTurkers d differ in um in certain health measures um from the from the general population he doesn't explain why What's interesting to me is that he points this out himself. He says, it's doubtful that commenting on a user's post is a plausible model for engaging misinformation at, a, at scale on social media and correcting specific misinformation. Uh, then he goes on to say, nevertheless, um, these two researchers argue it may be necessary and beneficial to say something when you see something. Does that statement, saying something when you see something, does that increase the validity of this experiment in your minds? No, not mine either. I don't want to sound mean, but without validity, an experiment is useless. That's why I said a couple times um, it's a moot point. Um, generalizability is a moot point if you don't have validity. Reliability is a moot point if you don't have validity. Like that um, target shooting um, ex uh, example we saw. You know, maybe an experiment is hitting the outer rim of that circle in the same spot every single time, but their target is the center of the target. Then, you know, what good is it to be hitting the same spot every time? So does Sullivan test um, whether or not we can leverage trust in libraries to combat misinformation? No. And this is one reason we librarians um, point to people people to a variety of sources and to not um, look at one factor when looking at authority of an article. I mean, this, this gentleman is a faculty member at Harvard and his, his research here is peer reviewed um, and yet we see the quality. If Sullivan had uh, valid methods, do you think that uh, we would reasonably see the library or the ALA reaching the same level of trustworthiness as the CDC when it comes to health information. Right. Uh, that's why librarians love primary sources and a lot of teachers uh, require primary sources. Um, why would a person go to the library over the CDC when it comes to health information? I think that is not necessarily a fair way to, or a, a fair comparison for libraries. Libraries are most likely trusted for general information, but not more so than, than an agency that specifies in a certain area. All right, who had the Sorenco research? All right, good, good. All right, um, let's start with the title. Does the title accurately reflect what the research is all about? Mm hmm Yes, good. It, I would say it does so exactly. It, it is a model of student learning outcomes of information literacy instruction in business school. Okay, let's look at the abstract. What should the abstract include? Mm hmm Yes. Okay, so exactly, yes. So the study, the nature of it, it presents and tests a research model of the outcomes of information literacy instruction given to undergraduate business students. How about the method? Yes, it's right here. It was a web survey. Okay, and the results? Yes, the results are right here. Um, the expectation, this confirmation, that they define later influences the perceived quality of the ILI instruction and student satisfaction. Those in turn affect student psychological outcomes and the outcomes influence student behaviors, which influence benefit outcome. Now that's a lot, but would you say that it is clearly and concisely stated? Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. It's linear, it's clear, and then they say, based on the findings, several recommendations are made. Is the purpose of the study clear? Mm -hmm. Yes. The purpose of the study is to present and empirically validate a model 
explicating student learning outcomes of information literacy instruction, or ILI, in a business school. Do the authors say why the information in this study is needed? Mm -hmm. Yes, they comment here that universities invest millions of dollars in subscriptions to various information resources. They talk about the kind of skills that are needed in today's workforce, which are information literacy skills, digital literacy. And they talk about a lack of empirically tested models to identify the factors that influence student learning outcomes, and that this study is an attempt to fill that void. Are terms um, defined? Mm -hmm. Yes, here we have the definition for information literacy, digital literacy, the expectation um, disconfirmation theory, um, both the positive and the negative disconfirmation effects. All right, how about the literature review? Mm -hmm. I agree. Others, I counted 30 different research articles that are referenced here. Um, one thing I really like about this particular uh, literature review is that, is that it's both a literature review and model development um, showing that they took this research, they studied, and used it to develop their model. Okay, thoughts about data collection? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is the study clear about who they are studying? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a study of full-time undergrad business students in a Canadian university. Mm -hmm. And how? Yes, they completed a survey. Okay, and how respondents were selected? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, um, it says right here, um, all 2049 registered full-time commerce students were invited through email, and there were three follow-up reminders, et cetera, et cetera. And then when they did get all of their respondents, they break it down here as to male, female, um, what year in school they're in, uh, what their major is. So I think it's, it's quite specific about who was studied. All right, our limitations of the study dis discussed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, they are. There are four listed here. Um, they talk um, about the generalizability, um, that it needs to be further explored. It may differ based on the curriculum and the content of the ILI instruction. Another generalizability concern um, how are the students defined? Are they clients, customers, um, professionals? And here they talk about, um, though this research proves the expectation disconfirmation theory, um, there may be other factors as well. They also talk about the limitations of a survey, the self-reporting, um, and suggest that um, further out out, um, excuse me, further research might benefit from using different methods um, such as direct ob observation or um, administration of information literacy tests. All right, evidence of bias, anyone? Mm -hmm. I really didn't see any um, Bias is, no study is 100% free of bias because researchers and respondents are human. Um, they discuss here the possibility of social desirability bias. Um, so they made the uh, question, uh, the surveys um, anonymous. Okay, ethical issues. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's a survey. I don't think there really are any on a survey on information literacy skills. Okay, thoughts about reliability and, and um, validity. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, here they talk about um, getting feedback from several IL researchers, and they did a comprehensive face validity assessment of the draft instrument 
consulting 34 IL academics, practitioners, librarians, and other experts and potential survey participants. Um, and then they made changes based on their feedback. Also, if we look at the test questions themselves, which are provided for us in this study, I, any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I think that they are very clearly um, asking what they really want to know. So, for example, at the expectation disconfirmation question. Compared to my initial expectations, the library instruction I received from the librarians was, and then they have it here, perceived quality in terms of the library instruction I received from the librarians. I feel the quality and then their options, improved use of online, excuse me, of on, online library resources. Um, as a result of the library instruction I received from the librarians, <clears throat> I select online library resources better um, and so on with their their options so if you i'm sure you read through each one i would say that they are all spot on asking what they are looking for is the writing clear and concise or pretentious and confusing thoughts i agree i think it is very clear and concise there were many many hypotheses but um, everything flows in a linear logical manner um, even the models to me are very self-explanatory very clear and easy to read was the study successful yes they write here of the three links that they used expectation, disconfirmation, and perceived quality, perceived quality and student satisfaction, and expectation, disconfirmation, and student, student satisfaction, there was a statistically significant result for all three of those relationships. Did the authors establish the merit of their study? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, they yielded several findings and recommendations. Um, they state that their work is important since it furthers our theoretical understanding and knowledge about the learning outcomes of IL instruction and provides recommendation for practice. Would you agree with that? Yes, I do too. They list here several um, applicable skills. Here are more implications of their work on um, promoting digital information literacy. They say governments worldwide have recognized the economic benefits in training a competent and capable digitally skilled business workforce and have made specific calls to academia to train students to become digitally literate. Would you agree that these are important skills to have for the workplace? I agree. So if we uh, agree that these are important skills to have, I think it follows that we need a way to measure the success of teaching those skills. Okay, and they conclude here by saying that better learner outcomes uh, ensure preparedness in a global economy. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Do you think they made a good case for the importance of their research? Yes, I agree. I think they did. Do the authors talk about the need for further research? Yes, they do. They talk about um, further research in other settings. Um, and they talk about research using a different method, which we touched on before. So instead of just self-reporting, maybe um, direct observation or administration of IL tests. What are your overall impressions of this research? Do you feel it is quality research that makes a valuable contribution? Yes, I agree. I, I think that it is. Any questions about this research or the previous article we talked about or research in general? 
Okay, if you could please fill out your exit ticket and turn that in and then you're free to go and I will see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Welcome back medical students. I hope you had a good night. Please help yourself to some breakfast. A big thank you to Dr. Julian at UB for allowing me to borrow her research evaluation assignment. She's brilliant at research. Okay, let's look at the exit tickets. It looks like some information was reviewed. That's great. Most of the information was clear. I'm glad. Um, there are a couple things that need clarification. Let's do that now. Let's check in with our learner objectives. First, you evaluated research using Dr. Julian's list of questions. Was this accomplished? Here's today's agenda. First, we will review today's learning objectives. Then you'll complete Duke's first module on EBP. Next, you will watch two videos on critical appraisal, and then you will choose your research article. Next, you'll have a break, and then you'll analyze your research using CASP. Next, you'll trade with your partner and analyze each other's articles, discuss where you agree and disagree. Then we'll share as a whole group. After lunch, we'll take a look at some resources, and then we will look at the grade assessment tool. Then we'll reflect on our learning, schedule a follow-up to this training, fill out evaluations, and then we'll dismiss, hopefully early. To fight boredom, let's switch formats. Okay, let's get started on today's content. We went through the U of R library to arrive at this page. This is a great introduction to evidence-based practice, and they have a great definition for evidence-based medicine that is it has a nice graphic to it, and it's, it's much simpler and clearer than, than the, the more wordy one that I showed you yesterday. And it also has a great pyramid for, for research with the best, best research is at the tip of the pyramid, and it's a hierarchy. It's very useful for you to take a look at. So please watch this, and afterward, we will watch two videos on critical appraisal. Please enjoy. Okay, please watch this video on critical appraisal. Um, it has a different angle and has some different things for you to look at when evaluating research than what we talked about yesterday. I apologize, the first probably two minutes are very dull and too basic, but the rest of the video has a lot of good information in it. It has that pyramid, again, of level of evidence. You might want to save in some way. I think that will be great to refer back to. Please enjoy. All right, any questions on this video or anything else? Okay, great. All right, here's our last video on critical appraisal. Um, please enjoy. Any questions on any of the new information regarding critical appraisal? or anything else for that matter. Okay. Okay, this is the CASP tool that I referred to earlier. Um, it is free to download and use by anyone under their Creative Commons license. So you can refer back to it anytime you want if you would like to. I just want to refer you first to the glossary. They have a great glossary here of just very simplified, just shorter, much shorter definitions. If you forget what any of these terms that we've talked about mean, you can just look here. Um, so it's just great to have. And let's go back to checklists. There are seven that apply to us. These are for print. So we're gonna go over to the right where it's edit electronically. Um, we have the systematic review, 
qualitative, randomized control trial, case control study, diagnostic checklist, cohort study, we're skipping, of course, economic, and the clinical prediction rule checklist. So I would like each of us to go around the room and one of us will read out each thing that is on the checklist. I will start and I will do systematic review. One, did the review address a question that was clearly focused? Two, did the authors look for the right type of papers? Three, do you think all the important relevant studies were included? Four, did the review's authors do enough to assess the quality of the included studies? Five, if the studies of the review have been combined, was it reasonable to do so? Six, what are the overall results of the review? Seven, how precise are the results? Eight, can the results be applied to the local population? Nine, were all imp important outcomes considered? And 10, are the benefits worth the harms and costs? All right, so can you please go ahead with the qualitative check? All right, now that we've read all seven checklists, any questions about any of them? Okay. All right, now we're going to go um, to the Edward G. Minor Library. And I just clicked on databases. I put in med, so it will bring up medical, medicine. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but if you run into any difficulties, sometimes strange things come up when you're trying to search or something is difficult. Just let me know I'm right here. Um, so that brought up lots of options for you, or you can, of course, you can also search by article, um, however you want to do it. And there's some options for you. Each of you, please, um, with your partner, um, each of you select an article. So you and your partner will each have your own individual article. And then I'll ask you to go through the CASP checklist with it. Later on, we will you will switch articles with your partner and analyze your partner's article and then compare and contrast to see what you both found and what you agreed on and what you did not agree on. All right, now that you've all had a chance to analyze your own article, trade with your partner and analyze your partner's article and compare notes with your partner to see where you agreed and disagreed. I wanna come back to the whole group so that everyone can benefit from hearing about each different article and various article types. So we'll go around the room and I would like each of you to just give a brief synopsis of what your article was studying, what type of article it was, and highlight things on the CASP list, checklist that you think are most relevant. And we'll start with you. All right, here's an example of what a student may have done with a systematic review. One, did the review address a clearly focused question? Yes, I would say it definitely did. It is talking specifically about the relationship between screen-based sedentary behaviors, or what they refer to later as SB, and symptoms of depression and anxiety in youth. Um, number two, did the authors look for the right types of papers? I think definitely yes. If you look at the selection criteria, it's peer-reviewed articles on humans, uh, adolescents, published in English. Um, the studies were restricted to screen-based studies. Non-screen-based studies of sedentary behavior were not used. And two of the authors each went through a systematic way of determining whether the study should be included or not, and then they came to a consensus. Number three, do I think all relevant important studies were included? 
I think it's kind of impossible to say if all were included. Um, the authors did acknowledge that there may have been some missing studies under strengths and limitations. Um, but you can see that on figure one on page four, they initially looked at, well, once they took out duplicates, they looked at 1,543 different articles. And they went through um, a stringent process of excluding studies based on things like physical activity being discussed, but not sedentary behavior specifically, um, general mental well-being, not specifically internalizing of depression or anxiety, um, using composite scores instead of specific data, and so on. So if if they're just talking about email, et cetera, that was not counted. So I think they did a good job of looking at a lot of studies. And number four, did the reviews authors do enough to assess the quality of the included studies? Um, you'll see here under extraction and evidence synthesis that they looked at confidence intervals, sample size, study design, study results, authors, year of publication, study measures, and moderators studied. So I think they did a good job also. Also, if you look at methodological quality assessment, two of the authors went through a scale that looked at six different factors, um, selection bias, study design, confounders, um, data collection tools, validity and reliability, withdrawals and dropouts, the percentage of participants that um, provided full data, and the appropriateness of the analysis of the study design. And then they compared results. And um, so I, I would say that they did a very good job of looking at the quality of the articles they were synthesizing. Number five, if the results of the review have been com combined, was it reasonable to do so? What I like about this um, synthesis is that they both show the studies individually and synthesize. So they took each of the 70 articles, um, put the author date, the number of participants, um, they, the design study, the measure of sedentary behavior, the measure of depression and or anxiety, um, and the results. They also gave each study a methodological quality score. So here you can see here, weak, moderate. And then we have here a synthesis of findings and implications where they combine the results of all the studies by category, such as um, was sex a factor, was the type of screen time a factor. So I would say it was both reasonable and necessary to combine the results. Number six, what were the overall results of the review? They did find um, a relationship between screen-based sedentary behavior and depression in teens. There was less clear results <clears throat> as far as sex. Sometimes there appeared to be, with some studies, a bigger problem with females. Other studies did not show that, so they're asking for more research in that area. Also, more research in the area of what type of screen time, more specifically than just computer use, but is it social media? Is it, um, what if it's video games, which type of video games? So they're calling for more research into that. Also, there is a lot more evidence for depression than, the, than there is for anxiety. So they're asking for more research in that area as well. How precise are the results? Under results, um, they look at every possible relationship, age, um, physical activity, other potential moderators, type of um, screen time, et cetera. 
and under each of those they give the number of studies that address that and specific numbers within that but I do not see any confidence intervals. Number eight, can the results be applied to the local population? I would say since it's um, preteens and teens they're looking at and screen time they're looking at that it would apply to any preteens and teens with screen, with screen time. Number nine, were all important outcomes considered? They looked at sex, um, age, type of screen time. I think they did a good job. I can't think of anything else that I would have wanted to see covered. Number 10, are the benefits worth the harms and costs? That one is not applicable to this type of study. All right, now that everyone has had a chance to analyze a bit of research that they chose themselves, using the CASP model and a neighbors and compared notes with the neighbors. And now that we've shared out and you've all gotten a chance to hear about the other research that everyone did, have you learned anything new? Mm -hmm. Great. Do you feel you know more now than you did um, the day before yesterday about analyzing research and how to tell what is quality research. Good. Do you know more about different types of studies that are out there? That is wonderful. Let's just take a second out to go back over our learning objectives to make sure that we feel we've made good progress. Uh, we've already talked about objective one. Two, the students will demonstrate an even deeper knowledge of the processes of analyzing quality research by choosing a research article of interest to them, determining which type of study it is. How do you feel we did on that? Any questions or comments? Are there any types of research that are confusing for you? Okay, um, then number three, we use the CASP or the Critical Appraisal Skills Program to appraise our studies. Any questions about that? How do you feel we did? Great, and then lastly, you'll further demonstrate your knowledge by trading with your paper, analyzing theirs, and then comparing and um, comparing and contrasting what your findings were. Did you learn anything from that exercise? What were your main takeaways with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, let's check in with where we're at with our agenda. We finished CAS. In a minute, we'll dismiss for lunch. The afternoon is going to be lighter. There won't be anything that you have to actually produce. Um, it's just going to be more things to look at. Some resources that I hope will be very useful for you in your career. We're going to look at grade, which is long and complicated and evol involves a, a panel of decision makers. Um, so, we're, But we're just going to look at it in case you haven't before. Um, and then we're going to reconvene in our large group, talk about learning, um, do evaluations, schedule a follow-up, and that will be it. Hopefully we will be done early today. So please go ahead and have lunch. All right, I'd like you to please take a look at this video. It's on Essential Evidence Plus. How many of you have used that? Okay, um, if you haven't, you're going to find it, I think, very useful. And it is available on the U of R Medical Library website. Please enjoy. All right, I just want to quickly show you um, on the Edward G. Minor Library, there are a lot of great resources listed right here on the left. We've got PubMed, um, MicromedX, and in here, Access Medicine, um, and here you have Cochrane Library, Embase, and here you have evidence-based plus 
I just wanted to show you that you have it there in case you haven't had a chance to see that. And if you have time, ever have time, please check out some of these other great resources. According to JAMA, 2,000 articles a day are published to PubMed. A lot of them are citations, reviews, guidelines, editorials. According to JAMA, out of those 2,000 articles published, less than 100 will apply to a, pr a practitioner's needs. So um, JAMA recommends this website, Evidence Alerts Plus. Excuse me, evidencealerts.com. They have a research staff who um, it rate the quality and the methodology of 45,000 articles a year for 125 different clinical journals worldwide. Physicians also rate the quality of the articles for clinical relevance and newsworthiness. You can submit a search for your own needs, and you can also sign up for emails, email alerts on topics of your interest. Access.org is also recommended by JAMA. Their articles are pre-appraised for clinical application and for quality. And you can also sign up for email alerts at this site um, on your topics of interest. Please take uh, about 15 minutes to take a look at all three of these, um, ref, uh, excuse me, resources that we just looked at. All right, now I'd like us to have a look at the grade assessment system. Please go to gradepro.org. Um, I would encourage you to sign up for your own account here. Um, it is free for all educators and students to use, and it has a wealth of information there. Once you log in, you can click on Tutorials and Facts and click on Videos. There's a lot of videos. The perfect one for right now is Overview of the Grade Approach. So please click on that. It's just six minutes long and we will discuss it when we're done. I'm sorry I lied. I would like you to please pause it at one minute and seven seconds and take a close look at this graph. It shows that the, the it shows the process that research goes through. And as I said, it takes a whole panel of experts. It probably takes years. Um, they start with a PICO question, which you will remember from the um, intro video. And I know that the um, Grade up and grade down, these things will look um, familiar to you. Um, this is just another model, um, but it's great to know about and it's great to have a membership because you can fill in your own forms. Um, I just thought CASP was a little simpler or just a little less complex for getting started with, but this is certainly something that it's great to be familiar with. All right, any thoughts on the grade system? Mm -hmm. Great. All right, now let's talk about the whole last two days. What did you learn? Um, what do you still need to learn? Is there anything about any of the training that surprised you? Is it what you expected? Anything at all? Mm -hmm. Great. I'm glad to hear it. All right, what I would like to do now is plan some follow-up. I don't want this to be a one and done type of training sessions. I want you to know that you can come back and see me at any time for any research situation, any help or support, anything at all related to the library, anything you need at all. I want to be here for you. I enjoy helping people and that's the most important part of my job. So let's talk about what would be the best way to follow up. Do you want to have a Zoom meeting? Do you want to meet in person again? What would work for you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, now that we've scheduled our Zoom follow-up meeting, I would like you to please fill out the evaluation. Please be brutally honest. I, I want this training to fit people's needs and I will use what you write to help me improve the training for next year. I also want to let you know that if you go to the Edward G. Minor Library page, you can um, scroll down to classes at minor and there are tons and tons of classes available um, there's bioinformatics there's um, ones here that might particularly interest you pubmed an introduction pubmed advanced um, there is finding evidence-based answers to clinical questions and there's also nuts and bolts of publishing in scientific literature. So hopefully um, I will see you again and, and um, hopefully the library will be of great use to you. Goodbye. I hope you're very proud of yourselves for going into the world's most important profession. I will enjoy the opportunity to help you in the future. Here's ways to stay in touch and get help. Best of luck in medical school.